Well, I guess we can go ahead and start. It doesn't look like a whole lot more people are coming in, and uh, so we can go ahead and begin. Uh, this is one of my favorite talks because, um, actually, I like all the talks I give. They're a lot of fun at this point. Um, after having done them several Mises use, um, uh, I really enjoyed this one, though, because this is sort of my bread and butter as an economist. This is what I studied when I was at Auburn in grad school, and uh, it's an important issue for economists to try to figure out, and particularly people who are free market economists who are confronted all the time with these arguments that the market can't handle environmental and resource issues, that free markets will end up with the despoilation of the environment, and uh, you know, we'll have extinction of species because um, companies don't give any attention to uh, environmental quality. And um, so I'd like to, to help you with this, and I'm going to spend a lot of time uh, talking about Ronald Coase. Um, Ronald Coase is the most cited economist of the last, well, maybe ever. Um, my, maybe Adam Smith, but in the last century at least, if you count up journal citations, which is sort of the way of keeping score for academics, um, Ronald Coase is uh, at the top. He won the Nobel Prize in economics in 19, I think it was 1990. And uh, so he's, he's uh, very well known. Um, he died just a couple of years ago at the age of 102. And uh, something about people who win Nobel Prizes, they live a long time. I don't remember how old Hayek was, but I think he was well into his 90s. Um, and so um, I want to I want to take you through some criticism of Coase from the Austrian perspective, because Austrians will look at Coase and say, "Well, there's some serious problems here. We need to think about this more carefully." And the rest of the economic mainstream has uh, has just been adoring Coase for a long time, and I have some pretty strong reservations about his his uh, his views on things. By the way, he was. I listened to an interview of him when he was about 101, and he was very sharp. Um, and uh, um, if you're if you're vertical at 101, you're doing great. Um, but he he had he had an incredible um, capacity to to work through some of these problems. Unfortunately, I think that they were um, they misled us in some in some directions. All right, so let's look at two key issues that are uh, tied up in this environmental discussion. One is environmental resource use. That's uh, deforestation. Um, uh, are we going to run out of oil? Uh, what about extinction of species? Um, things like uh, how, how are we going to conserve energy? How are we going to conserve water? I mentioned right before the talk began something about the new dishwasher regulations. These are resource conservation questions. And uh, uh, those of us that, that think markets do a really good job of handling resource uses will tend to say, well, you know, if you leave this to the market, then uh, as long as you have private ownership of these, of these things and don't have uh, common access, then these resources will be priced appropriately. We're not going to run out prematurely. There have been lots of predictions over time um, that we're going to run out of oil. I mean, we saw that prediction about 100 years ago, believe it or not. Uh, people were saying, we're going, to, we're going to run out of oil. We've only got seven years of oil left. And of course, we didn't run out of oil. Uh, William Stanley Jevons, that uh, British economist of the uh, 1800s, uh, worried that, we're, that they were going to run out of oil. Of, um, coal, and the, the Industrial Revolution was going to come to a screeching halt. Uh, and years after his, he died, his children were cleaning out his attic with uh, a stockpile of paper that he had, he had gathered up because he was worried that they were going to run out of paper. So there's been a lot of these kind of concerns, um, um, ill-founded, I think, in, in a lot of cases, but... Um, uh, nevertheless, that's an important part of what we, what we think about in environmental economics. Second, um, second issue within environmental economics is the externality issue. And this is commonly regarded as a uh, source of market failure. So if you've taken a traditional mainstream economics course, you're going to find there's three 
types of market failure that are, that are uh, given to you in, in almost any textbook. Um, externalities, that is accidental side effects of your production or consumption activity. Um, uh, public goods uh, are considered a source of market failure, that the markets don't provide enough public goods. Uh, I don't know what enough is or how you'd find out what that is, uh, that magic number, and I don't know how you'd know that government's gonna not, not going to make things worse rather than better, but that's another discussion for another day. And then the third is uh, market power. You heard uh, Tom DiLorenzo earlier in the week on antitrust and monopoly issues, so um, I'm sure he handled that quite capably. But we're going to focus on this externality issue here. Um, now, things really aren't as separate as it may appear. I mean, externalities really boil down to questions over ownership of a particular resource. Uh, we talk about air pollution, water pollution, solid waste pollution, noise pollution as being examples of externalities. But really, we're dealing with uncertainty over who owns the resource, who owns the air that has these particles being emitted into it? Who owns the uh, water that has uh, some kind of waste being poured into it? We all use the air or want to use the air and the water for different purposes. We don't necessarily know offhand which purpose is the most valuable. So I'm gonna argue that if you turn over these resources to private ownership, you're gonna to tend to get the most valuable uh, use of these resources in society. All right, so there's three basic approaches uh, to this uh, externality problem. One is the Pigovian approach, um, named for Arthur Cecil Pigou, who held uh, what later became uh, John Maynard Keynes's chair at Cambridge. And Pigou said, well, what you need to do is figure out how much this pollution is costing and then tax. An, an amount that will induce the polluter to cut back on the pollution. Or if you're creating a positive side effect, a positive externality, then uh, Pigou said we should subsidize the positive externality, subsidize whatever that activity is. So for example, if my mother is growing roses in her front yard, for her own benefit and her own pleasure, and uh, passers-by on the sidewalk benefit from being able to look over and see her beautiful roses, then according to Pigou, she should get a subsidy for her rose growing so that she grows a larger amount since she's creating these, um, these side effects for her neighbors. Well, of course, that quickly descends into something quite absurd. Um, I should get a subsidy under this kind of uh, uh, arrangement for wearing deodorant. Since I'm reducing negative externalities by doing so, I uh, should be subsidized for this. And uh, again, this is um, pretty much everything we do creates some kind of side effect. And to imagine that government is capable of identifying all of these side effects, positive and negative, to imagine that government can measure with any degree of precision what those side effects are worth, positive and negative, and then administer this fairly without any uh, bias toward the people who funded their campaigns, without any uh, uh, influence from businesses that would like to use this tax subsidy scheme to gain economic rents. To imagine any of this is just, is just in, the, in the realm of fantasy, I would, I would say. Then there's a regulatory approach um, where government says, we're gonna force you to reduce emissions to a level that we regard as socially efficient. Now, of course, the logical question here would be, what's socially efficient? How do we know what that level is? How do we know how many gallons of water a dishwasher ought to use? How many, how many gallons per flush should a toilet use? We don't really know that. Uh, and, and of course, neither does government. Uh, and there are a lot of other problems that enter into this as well. For example, the regulations that um, have attempted to get people to swap out their incandescent light bulbs for compact fluorescent or LED light bulbs um, might well be uh, uh, an effort by some of the large light bulb manufacturers to uh, suppress their competition. There are lots and lots of incandescent light bulb manufacturers 
And uh, GE and I think Philips and some of the others lobbied to get uh, this new technology mandated by law so that they could sell more of their light bulbs and the competitors could be um, uh, uh, removed from the market. And a third approach is the property rights approach, which includes a um, common law approach, which includes attention to tort law as a way to deal with environmental problems. And I'm going to suggest that uh, Rothbard, uh, Rothbard's approach, if you look at his famous paper, Law, Property Rights, and Air Pollution, Rothbard's approach is one that relies on tort law, on nuisance, as a way to handle these kinds of problems. And then there's Coase, uh, who wants judges to decide who should get the resource. And then um, he imagines that if transaction costs are low enough, then people might be able to negotiate amongst themselves once the property rights have been decided. Now, there's two key problems with the mainstream approaches, and I'll try to move through this quickly. There is a little bit of technical stuff here, but we'll, we'll work it out. All right, first, efficiency is an individual goal-seeking problem, not a value maximization problem. All right, that's Roy Cordato that I'm referencing here. He teaches at North Carolina State University. He's written a little book on externalities, which I believe the Mises Institute has in the bookstore. Um, if not, I'm sure you can find it um, online. And uh, it's a great treatment of, of externalities. And um, he argues basically that from the Austrian perspective, efficiency is attained when legal institutions allow individuals to pursue their ends. This is not some sort of social efficiency that we're after here that we can somehow observe separately from individual goal seeking. All right. Conflicts will arise over the use of scarce goods. That's the nature of scarcity, that there is some, there are competing ends for, or competing goals for the same resource. But the Austrian economist doesn't try to assess the value of those alternative uses and then decide who should get what. And that is because costs are subjective and cannot be measured. There's one thing you get out of this talk this morning. That's the thing I want you to see. Costs are subjective and cannot be measured. The implications of this are far reaching. Now, if you take a Typical uh, environmental economics course, you'll run into this graph a good bit. Um, most of you may not have seen this. If you haven't had economics before, I'll try to explain it very briefly. All right, so the MPC, MSC, MPB here are marginal private costs, the cost to the firm of producing the product. This is the quantity of output on the horizontal axis. So the more they produce, the higher that marginal private cost is gonna go. They have to pay more and more to get the scarce resources into their production process. The opportunity costs are rising as they bring more raw materials and more labor into their production process. MSC here is the marginal social cost. All right, so that is higher than the private cost. It's the additional cost to the rest of society from these side effects, these externalities. So if I'm producing electricity, let's say, and I've got a smokestack uh, for the uh, coal fire that is uh, heating the water to run my uh, turbines, and the coal burning generates some kind of emissions, and the emissions uh, uh, cause uh, problems for other people, then that's part of that social cost, the cost to bystanders who had nothing uh, particularly to do with the production or the consumption of that product. And then we have the marginal private benefit, which is this downward sloping curve, and that's the benefit to, um, to the firm of producing the good and selling it. That's the revenues that they're getting from selling increasing quantities of the good. All right, so um, I should mention, by the way, here that the social cost is not just the externalities, the side effects to everybody else, it's also the cost to the firm, since the firm is part of society, okay? So, the firm by itself is looking at its bottom line, and it's looking at the benefits to itself and the costs 
to itself. And so it will decide that the optimal quantity of output will be right here at Q. I think that's an M there. I'm not sure why it shows M. But uh, that quantity is the, is the amount of output the firm would find ideal. But if you look at this from the point of view of the rest of society, then you'd say, oh, well, there's these other costs the firm didn't take into consideration. They didn't think about the smoke landing, uh, the particles landing on, uh, on other people. Uh, so uh, if they had taken those costs into account, then they would have chosen a smaller quantity here at Q star. That's what they would have, would have chosen had they taken into account the side effects, positive and negative, of all of their production. So the argument then is that the government, under, say, a Pigovian system, where they tax and subsidize, should try to figure out how much this is, how much that distance is, and apply a tax to the firm of that amount. The tax forces the firm to take into consideration those external costs and pushes the firm back toward Q star. Alternatively, they could regulate and say, we don't care what your costs are, we're going to force you to produce here at Q star. And that's the way we're going to handle it. In both of those cases, the government is in a position of having to discover something they can't discover, of having to have information they can't have. They don't know what that distance is. Costs, as I said, are subjective. They don't know what it really costs someone to have the emissions from a coal-fired power plant uh, in their air or their water. They don't really know this. And there's no, no good way to find this out. If you went, say, door to door with a survey form and said, hi, I'm from the government, I'm here to help, I would, don't laugh. <laughs> well, you can laugh. Uh, so I, I would like to know that this, this uh, power plant over here is belching smoke into the air. We'd like to know how much that costs you every year because we're trying to figure out how much to tax the coal-fired power plant. Now, first of all, people have trouble figuring this out for themselves. They don't really have a good idea of how much that power plant's affecting them, badly, uh, bad or good. Um, but then it, they, they, they might have their own reasons for either exaggerating on the plus side or the minus side what the, what the costs really are. So they might have, it, you know, have a grudge against the, uh, the guy that owns the power plant or something, and they think they were overbilled one year. So they, they say, well, it's ruined my life. It costs me, if you had to put a value on it, it'd be $100,000 a day or something. Okay, well, $100,000, all right. So we go to the next neighbor and we tally up their score. Somebody else might say, well, you know, I work for the power plant. I don't want them to tax the power plant because I have my job there. I'm going to say that the cost is nil. So you, you can't get good information on this, and therefore you can't really decide where this point is. All right, now some implications of this kind of analysis. I mentioned earlier resource use questions. Overuse of resource, resources, as we see with a tragedy of the commons, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but basically that's when a resource is open for anybody and everybody to use. Nobody can say no, uh, and the pasture gets overgrazed or the uh, water gets uh, overextracted from the well or um, uh, the uh, passenger pigeons get shot uh, to a, to, at a too high a rate or something like that. The, the resource is not owned and therefore it gets overused, okay? So um, this, uh, you can't see that, but it says this assumes that we know the optimal rate of use. We don't really know that. We don't really know where the marginal benefit, marginal social benefit equals the marginal social cost. We don't know where those curves intersect, and that's important. We don't know the appropriate tax. And for those people who say, well, you know, I'm pro-market. I want tradable permits. I want the government to issue permits for each ton of sulfur dioxide that this 
this power plant emits, I want them to have to have in hand a permit from the government. Now, the green tinted far left doesn't like this because they regard emitting sulfur dioxide as a environmental sin per se. So they don't, they think this is licensing bad behavior, sort of like licensing, I don't know, prostitution or something. They think this is terrible. Uh, but then uh, there are others who say, well, this is really, this is really pro-market, you see, because we're allowing these permits to be traded in a market and there's a price and so forth. That doesn't solve the problem. And it's not really a market. It's, it's like Mises would say, we're pretending at markets, but it doesn't make it into a true market. Because who's determining the quantity of permits available in this, mar in this market? Who can either raise or lower that quantity of markets on a whim? That's the government. So ultimately, we're not really solving the problem. Now we might gain some, uh, some efficiencies from not having to uh, uh, treat every power plant the same. The ones that can cut costs cheaply will do so, and those that can't cut costs cheaply won't do so. So it might not be as bad as some other systems we could think of, but you're still setting the quantity of pollution at some level, which we don't have the information to do. We don't know where that level should be set. We don't know, the government certainly doesn't know, whether there should be a million tons of sulfur dioxide permits out there in the market, or 10 million tons of sulfur dioxide, or 100 million tons. We don't have any good way to tell where that should be. And as long as we don't have that information, this is pretending to be uh, pro-market when in fact, um, uh, it's, it's really not. Art Carden um, wrote an article um, for us in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, which I am, I'm on the editorial staff, and we have just in the last uh, year to maybe five, maybe it was four or five issues back, we had, um, we've had a number of articles on environmental issues, which I, I think are, are uh, valuable if you want to look those up and take a, take a, take a read. Um, Art Carden says that the calculation objection to emissions trading schemes, which I've basically just told you, is more than a simple how do you know conversation stopper. Finding the right amount of emissions to allow might require some trial and error, but credible commitment remains an important potential obstacle. What incentive is there for a state to specify a particular level of carbon emissions that will be allowed each year and then not change in this in response to political pressure? So he's saying, well, you know, trial and error, maybe we can find the right amount. Now, I, I, I disagree. I don't think, I mean, I think trial and error requires some real information from a voluntary economy like profit and loss. Um, but he's pointing out this credi credible commitment problem, which is a very serious one. How do we know that lobbying or some other pressure on the government is not going to result in changes to whatever this level of pollution permits we have um, circulating in the market? We don't. So the scarcity of these permits could change arbitrarily and with very little notice. He says, the information needed to know whether a particular regulation works quite literally does not exist. And the key difference between firms and governments is that firms trying to decide how much to advertise have market tests for their decisions. Now, that's, he, he gets a few points back on this because he's saying this is basically the test of whether we're using resources efficiently. Maybe I'll give him all the points back. I like art. He's a great guy. Um, so he says, governments don't have this information. Now, this is that one of those articles in a, in a several among several that we have in the QJAE on, um, on uh, environmental issues lately. All right, what about cost of the environment? Well, uh, no such thing. There are cost to individuals, 
who might want to use the environment for various purposes. And I don't mean just that they want to cut down all the trees or suck out all the oil. I mean, you might have people who say, my use of the environment would be to have ecotourism. Or my use of the environment would be to leave these uh, acres of trees alone and enjoy looking at them and watching the wildlife that, that live there. And, and that's, that's what I think is the highest and best use of the property. The issue becomes a matter of violating the property rights of another person, not about exceeding some level of emissions or damaging the environment. Rory Cordato, whom I mentioned earlier, uh, says pollution is therefore not about harming the environment, but about human conflict over the use of physical resources. Humans change the environment in such a way that it harms others. There's your cost. It harms others who might be planning to use it for conflicting purposes. That's how we can, that's the kind of information we need to determine whether resources are being used uh, well or badly. Carl Minger, whom you've heard about from earlier this week, History of the Austrian School, one of the founders of the Austrian School, said, when all members of society compete for a given quantity of goods that is insufficient, a practical solution to the conflict of interest is only conceivable if the goods pass into the possession of some of the economizing individuals. That is, private ownership of the resources is essential to, um, uh, to an efficient use, and efficient, not inefficient and efficient use. And if these individuals are protected by society in their possession to the exclusion of all other individuals. When you can string barbed wire across a pasture and say that, that pasture's mine, and you can regulate the use of it according to your own feedback of profit and loss, then you've got efficient use of the property. Now I mentioned I would go through some stuff on coasts here. Now, uh, I've got a lot I could say later. I'm just going to have to take the remaining time, I think, and go through, um, go through this on the Coase Theorem. But the Coase Theorem says that in the absence of transaction costs, anybody know what transaction costs are? Some of you? Tariffs? Uh, no, that's a tax. A transaction, costs exist, uh, transaction costs exist whenever you have, well, I guess by some definitions you could use a, you could refer to a tax as a tariff, as a, as a transaction cost, right? It's a, it's a cost of searching out, negotiating, and consummating an exchange. So when I go to the store and I have to wander through the aisles a little bit to find what I want, that's part of my transaction cost. When I have to stand in line, that's part of the transaction cost. When I have to pay a little fee to use my debit card and the checking account owner does pay part of that fee indirectly. When I, that's part of my transaction cost. Uh, that's all. Now, Coase says if you can do this costlessly, then he says the outcome, that is the amount of pollution, will be the same regardless of the initial assignment of property rights. In other words, he's saying with zero transaction costs, it doesn't matter whether one party gets the rights to the property or the other party gets the rights to the property. Now, transaction costs aren't zero, and he didn't argue that they were. He was creating a kind of a fictitious world to, to, to study this. And so he said courts ought to balance these costs and benefits to both sides and make a determination of who should get the property rights. So we're back to this kind of statist assumption that governments have enough information to make these decisions appropriately. This is Harold Demsetz, by the way, he's a Kosey, and there's an interesting exchange going way back between uh, Walter Block and Harold Demsetz in the old uh, Review of Austrian Economics uh, from years and years back. So it's, a, it's, uh, it's very, very interesting, it was useful to me and sorting through some of these things. Uh, but Dempsess is a Coasean, and, and the, the, the Coasean approach neglects this problem of the subjectivity of costs and benefits that I mentioned earlier. 
So let's think about this. Classic case, it's in the Coast, uh, Coast paper from 1960. Um, steam locomotive rolling along the tracks, sparks and stuff coming out of the smokestack and landing on the fields beside the tracks. The fields sometimes catch fire and burn the farmer's crops. Uh, or, well, in this case, an orchard. So um, we're going to talk later about the efficiency versus the ethics here. I don't think you can take ethical decision-making out of this, out of this um, subject. But let's think about the railroads versus the orchards. The orchards are destroyed by sparks from the passing train. And let's suppose there's a hundred, you can't read this unfortunately, but a $100,000 re reduction in the market value of the property of the orchard farmer. He's got to either pull his orchard trees back from the tracks to avoid them being burnt and lose the value of that property, or he's got to suffer the occasional loss of the trees. Uh, so let's suppose the market value of the um, property is now $15,000 instead of $115,000 because of this risk. Let's suppose that there is a cost of uh, the spark reduction devices that the railroad could employ and that that cost is $120,000. So the farmer has lost um, $100,000 of property. The cost of the spark reduction devices is $120,000. So let's suppose the court decides that the farmer should have the rights for whatever reason. The farmer wins the case against the railroad. The railroad pays $100,000 then to compensate the farmer. After the case is won, the railroad comes to the, or after the railroad loses the case, the railroad goes to the farmer and says, look, you won. We hate that, but um, would you be willing to accept $100,000 if you allow us to avoid the spark reduction device and continue to throw sparks on your orchard? Because frankly, it's going to cost us a lot to, to cut back on the sparks. So if you just take this payment, then uh, you'd be compensated, and we'd be happier, and we can all go about our business. The farmer would have reason to accept that offer, and the railroad, of course, would, would benefit from off making that offer. So probably uh, if the transaction costs are low enough, the outcome would be the railroad continues to throw the sparks. So the trees are gone. The devices are not installed. And society, according to the Kosian, gains by $20,000 relative to the alternative. Because instead of incurring a $120,000 cost, Society incurs only the $100,000 cost. In case two, the railroad gets the rights. Court decides the opposite. Now, the farmer is not going to be willing to pay as much as $120,000 to induce the railroad to install the devices. So the devices are not installed. The trees are gone. In other words, from the Kosian perspective, we get the same result and society gains by $20,000. Now, let's suppose that in addition to the $100,000 reduction in the market value of the property, so that the farmer now has to suffer, the, the farmer suffers the loss of the trees and the market value of the property is $15,000 now, as before, but there's an additional subjective loss to the farmer. The farmer may have some non-tangible attachment to these trees. This was the orchard that his great-great-great-grandfather planted. And he uh, proposed to his wife under that tree over there. Now, I don't know what it could be. But he's got a 900, I'm just throwing out a number here, $900,000 psychological loss to the farmer. It's just almost uh, where you, you can't, he, 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 would, he would be crushed if he lost his or, orchard, okay? So 
Also, $120,000 cost of spark reduction devices. Case two, railroad gets the rights. Total market value of the property is only $115,000. Um, so even if he sold the property, he would not be able to compensate the railroad enough to induce them to install the spark reduction device. There's no way he can, I mean, the, the psychological loss is not something he can sell, get enough money to pay the railroad, and he can't borrow money. I mean, what bank is going to say, well, your collateral is the psychological value of the property to you? Can't do that. So then, the farmer can't raise the $120,000 to induce the railroad to install the devices. And we're assuming there, that this is the sum total of his net worth and all of that. The point is, the devices are not installed, the trees are gone, just as the Kosian would pre uh, predict, but society now loses by $120,000 minus $100,000 minus $90,000, uh, $900,000. So there's an $880,000 loss to society in this case because the Kosian ignored this. And I'd suggest to you that it is normal that the value to an individual of an asset they have that it is normal that that value to them be higher than the market value. How do I know this? Well, um, most people, uh, most uh, most people do not have their houses on the market, and don't. Um, you know, they the market value of the house is lower than the value to them. The minute it's the reverse, what do they do? They put it on the market. They try to sell it. I mean, there are some transaction costs, but, uh, or take, for example, the engagement ring I gave my wife. I, I, you know, do you think that if she had that thing appraised and then the jeweler said, that's the appraisal and I'll give you that plus a thousand dollars, do you think she would sell it? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I certainly hope not. <laughs> Uh, there, this, is a, this is my gold wedding ring. Uh, I don't know how much the gold in it's worth. And it's not a lot, but probably get something for it, $100 or something. This belonged to my father before he died. My mother gave it to me, or gave it to my wife, my fiance at the time, to give it to me when we got married. You think I'd take the melt value of this for this ring? There's a lot of psychological value in this thing. If I lost it, I'd, I'd tear the house apart trying to find it, okay? So we can't forget that value which is pervasive in society, this kind of psychological value. Coase is only looking at the market value. Now back to the efficiency question. Here's, of course, Murray Rothbard, and in, his, um, in uh, Rizzo's book, Time, Uncertainty, and Disequilibrium, Rothbard says we cannot decide on public policy, tort law, rights, or liabilities on the basis of efficiencies or minimizing of costs. Now, tort law says if someone aggresses against another person by invading their property or affecting their person with pollution, if I blow smoke in your face, if I throw an aluminum can on your front yard, etc., they can be held strictly liable in a court and required to stop or enjoined is the technical term for this. A harm is generally understood as physical invasion of, a, of your person or property. So if I can show that there is a harm to you or a threat of harm that is near, well, maybe not a threat, but if there is a if there is a harm to you that is personal, physical, you can show that it's happened to you. I have, let's say I develop um, a disease as a result of your um, uh, burdening me with, with your emissions of some kind. 
then I've got grounds for a court case. Now, it's important to recognize that the decline in value of property is not an invasion. So if, um, if I open up a Walmart next to your, um, your retail outlet, and your retail outlet loses value because of my Walmart, that's not an invasion. Economists will refer to this as a pecuniary externality. Changes in supply and demand will occur and will affect the value of your property. But that's not inefficient and it's not an invasion. Um, you can't read the next line, but, but I, um, uh, Schumpeter referred to creative destruction, where there's, uh, whenever a new product comes out, the old products lose value. That's not an invasion. You're not entitled to the valuation other people put on your assets. If somehow people came up with a way to uh, manufacture um, diamonds that are identical to the kind you dig up out of the ground, maybe they have already, I don't know, but um, that, so that the world is flooded with diamonds that are, that are identical to the ones that, uh, that people have in their jewelry now, um, they're not entitled to any kind of compensation. This is not something that you can sue for because you're not entitled to the subjective value that other people place on your, on your assets. That's not your property. Their evaluation of your property is not your property. Hope that makes sense. All right. Um, there's this, uh, Rothbard goes into this in Law, Property Rights, and Air Pollution, this, the, the uh, reasonable man versus strict liability. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on that um, here because I'm running short. I will point out that a key aspect of Rothbard's take on pollution issues is homesteading. You can homestead property, of course, if it's unclaimed by anybody else, and you go onto that property, you mix your labor with the land in a Lockean sense, and um, maybe you fence it off, you um, graze your cattle on it or something. That's your property by homesteading. But you can also homestead in other senses. So for example, if I have a quiet homestead, uh, and then um, somebody buys the property next door to me, and builds a, um, a massive international airport, and now I've got jet aircraft screeching overhead at um, five o'clock in the morning. I'm, I'm according to my uh, homesteading principle here, I have cause to take the airport to court. I had homesteaded a certain degree of quiet or a certain level of noise that was customary in my neighborhood. That became part of my reasonable expectation that, that, I, that, that was part of my property. And so it would be no different than if somebody had opened up a factory next door to me and uh, dumped pollution on my head. It's an invasion in, in, Rothbard, in the Rothbardian sense. So we can have air pollution homesteading the line you can't see there is that air is a dumping ground, um, and that is valuable. I dump carbon dioxide into the air every time I exhale. I'm using the atmosphere as a way to dump uh, a, a, uh, um, a gaseous waste, in a sense. Um, so that, that's valuable. It's, it's helpful to have a place to dump your, your waste. Any production process, any consumption process generates waste. We have to have a place to put it. That's a valuable use of air. But so is breathing. And there's no categorical, there's no way to categorically say, well, air should always and only be used for breathing and never be used for dumping waste. And we can't say the reverse either. These are, there are trade-offs that we have to um, arrive at. And homesteading is a way to establish property rights over something as uh, vaporous as air. Um, Coase mentions this uh, problem of coming to the nuisance. I'm going to skip over that too because I've only got about a minute left. Uh, let's see, I'll skip 
that. Okay. Um, boundary crossings in the sense of trespass. Trespass is not just if I walk on walk across an imaginary line uh, on your property and I I'm now on your property. But trespass can take other forms as well. Um, boundary crossings. Now, is a radio station that's broadcasting and sending radio waves across your property trespassing? Not according to Rothbard. It's, it's insensible, that is, it, you can't feel it, there's no, um, I know some people would argue about this, but there's no, argument, there's no evidence that it actually harms you when it crosses your property. Um, you could go on and live your life normally with that radio wave transmission. So that's a boundary crossing, but it's not really trespass. Air traffic, I mean, do you have any claim over the airport because they're flying over your house from 30,000 feet? No. Rothbard says, and I'll close with this because I'm out of time, the proper distinction is between visible and tangible or sensible invasion, which interferes with possession and use of the property, and invisible, insensible boundary crossings that do not and therefore should be outlawed only on proof of harm. I strongly encourage you to read Law, Property Rights, and Air Pollution uh, by Rothbard if you're interested in this kind of issue, and also some articles in the recent uh, QJAE if um, you want to look at some of the more recent scholarship on this. Thank you for your attention. Have a uh, great rest of the day.